my screen visible? I mean, yes, my yes, PowerPoint yes. visible? So yes, I can yes. now st stop my video, right? You don't need my video any longer. Right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks again to Saji for a very, very extensive introduction, which I don't really deserve. And I am no expert in Triple F when uh, Sajiv asked me, I thought this may be a good topic because I recently prepared for it for another meeting. So it may be easy for me to discuss with you without spending much time on preparation. Straight away, I'll go, into, go on to this. Uh, when we discuss about a triple of beams, the first question that comes up is, why do you need a triple of? I'll, I'll just move to the next slide. Just a, a list of things that I'm going to discuss, which is the genesis of a triple F properties of triple F beams and what do you do for acceptance and quality assurance and how do you clinically use it you know some sp cases that i will show that i uh, did and then conclude there first question would be why flattening filter why do you need a flattening filter first in a linear accelerator uh, nowadays uh, most of you must have seen the profile of uh, uh, triple F beam so you know how it looks how it looks compared to uh, double of beam but the days when we were, I was a student, there was no way I could see a profile for a triple F beam without a flattening filter. Uh, H.E. Johnson Cunningham book was my like Bible, where I could see this picture, which is very, very self-explanatory. When an electron beam of high energy impinges on a transmission target like this, most of the radiations X-rays produced, the brimstone produced, is in the forward direction as shown here. But for low energy photons, it goes in the lateral in a particular angle. So if you see a final composite, probably you would get a profile something like this, which is very similar to we get now. I'll show you a little more on this. For example, if you look at this, this is the profile now you get for any triple of beam, right? It's quite interesting to see, which we studied theoretically with the H.E. John's book earlier. So when you don't have a flattening filter, your beam is more forward peaked. And in those days, the idea was to give a uniform dose distribution. So one would like to have a uniform beam profile. So they decided to flatten this profile and they introduced a flattening filter. So a flattening filter was introduced between the uh, target and the chamber and the final resultant beam profile became a flat beam profile. You could ask me, it is not uh, strictly flat. You see a dip at the middle, which means the central axis dose is lower than the off axis dose. This we refer to as the horns. And the reason being for this is the flattening filter, one flattening filter used for one particular energy and made for certain reference field sizes. When you go to other field sizes, it may not make it exactly flat and you tend to get a dip at the middle which is referred to as the horns at the off-axis regions. What are the implications of having a flattening filter? What you see in the picture is an actual flattening filter, which I removed personally from the Primus linear accelerator. When you introduce this in the path of the beam, the dose rate is substantially reduced. There is an increased scatter photons from the flattening filter. There is scattered photons coming out of this. And the beam, X-ray beam, which is a Bremstrahlung beam, which is polychromatic, when it moves through this and you know, passes through this, is soft beams are cut off and the beam is hardened. So you have a beam hardening because of the high Z material. And also the it is placed on a low Z material, which reduces the electrons produced in the thin target and helps cooling the target also. And the therapeutic beams normally we use like about 10 MV or 15 MV, anything more than 8 MV would produce neutrons due to um, photonuclear interactions with the material in the path of its beam. And flattening filter is one of the main sources of neutrons from a linear accelerator. Let me go a little bit into the genesis of uh, triple F beam and uh, where it started. I think it was early in the 90s, 1991, there is a publication by Wobrain uh, from the Sunnybrook Hospital in Canada, where they wanted to do stereotactic radio surgery and wanted to finish the treatment faster, wanted to increase the dose rate, and this, thus they removed the flattening filter. 
So the removing the flattening filter, actually the monitor chamber was adjusted to keep the same output of 250 MU per minute, but the size of the MU was made larger. Right now, when you do your calibration, you keep one CGY per MU, but the number of MUs per minute is higher. Like for example, 10 MV is 2,400 and one uh, 6 MV is 1,400 or so. But they kept the MU per minute constant, but increased the size of the MU. That is the dose per MU. And the pre-amplifier circuitry was changed to adjust the gain on the monitor chamber. The monitor chamber is now looking at a higher dose per MU, so the gain had to be adjusted on that. And as I said, the pulse rate was not altered, but the dose per pulse was altered. The dose per pulse increased by about 2.75 times. Now they were getting, instead of 250 CGY, they were getting 688 CGY per minute. And there was a decrease in scatter due to the removal of the flattening filter. And there is decrease in dose outside the beam. There was decreased dose in outside the beam. And the effective energy decreased from 2.19 MeV to 1.63 MeV for a 6 MeV photon beam. So this is because of the lack of uh, beam hardening effect there. And more importantly, you know, generally the beam steering is servo control with signals from the quadrant electrometer. You know, you have a quadrant electrometer there, which sends the signal with which the beam is servo controlled so that your symmetry and flatness are proper. And this needed minor modifications for the triple F beam. So they had to do two electronic changes. One was the servo control circuitry had to be changed and the PC circuitry has to be changed for the MU size, monitor size of the uh, MU, that's the dose per MU. And this dose per MU and the servo control for triple up frame, for every radio surgery, they had to change that when they remove the flattening filter. When they put back the flattening filter, the circuitry board was removed. So this needed a lot of expertise from the person who was doing, and it also was little time consuming. But the interesting thing was it reduced the treatment time, which was a beneficial thing for the patient, the movement and other issues. Then they implemented this in Siemens linear accelerator first, which had a sliding flattening filter. So it was easy to implement. You don't need to remove it, can slide back and forth. Before actual flattening filter free beam came into radiotherapy, there were other accelerators that used the triple F, that is without the flattening filter. One is the Scantitronic Racetrack Microtron, which had a scanning beam which actually composed of several Bremsstrahlen distribution and didn't have to have a flattening filter. You may also know that helical tomotherapy and the cyber knife, they never had a flattening filter and not having a flattening filter was easy for them to have a compact design with the X-band linear accelerator for both helical tomotherapy as well as for cyber knife. So WFs have been considered as an integral part of medical linac for 50 years. The flattening filter was part of it. Like it were, you know, we can't imagine without a flattening filter in the early days of linear accelerator. But later, when that was the days when we wanted to have a uniform distribution, uniform um, fluence of the beam. But when SRS and IMRT came in, people were looking at having uh, inhomogeneous dose di distribution and non-uniform fluence across the beam. Then it made sense for people why to make a non-uniform beam to a uniform beam and then again make it like a non-uniform beam. Rather, you can use the non-uniform fluence to grade or some other non-uniform fluence and use it for radiation therapy. And the triple, triple F mode started becoming part of linear accelerator. What are the implications of removing the flattening filter? I will talk to you about the implications of having a flattening filter earlier. Now, what are the implications of removing it? You're removing it also not just as easy, right? I used to jokingly say when you remove a flattening filter, the cost of the LINAC goes high, but there are some implications actually. Uh, removing the flattening filter, the beam output increases that we know very well because there is no attenuation by the flattening filter. The effective energy is now decreased. So the depth dose characteristics will be different. Beam profiles undergo a very different changes. The profile is not the same. And so the penumbra, how to measure the penumbra is a question. And out of field dose is advantageous to us. You also have to look at things like leaf transmission and dosimetry leaf gap. So how does the increased dose rate or dose pulse, pulse affect our dosimetry? Dose rate actually is seen to raise by about 2.3 times for a 
uh, open beam in the case of a triple F from double F. The performance of the ion chamber for such a high dose rate has to be checked. You know, whether your ion chamber can measure such a high dose rate. So you need to do a study. Actually, this uh, significant uh, information about this is given in the paper by uh, Cashmore et al. in Physics, Medicine, Biology in 2008, where they have studied for dose rate, dose per pulse effect for any chamber, I think. And they found that it has to be overlapping for double F and triple F, and there isn't much significant variation. So, but however, it is good practice to check it for your ion chamber and your dosimeter. The second thing is the effect of steering and bending current. See, in a linear accelerator, mechanical positioning of the flattening filter and accurate steering of electron beams are very, very important. If a steering is very important, our flatness and symmetry will go off and there will be non-uniformity and you need to, you know, keep worrying, uh, meddling with it and keep changing it, meddling with it and changing it. So positioning is very accurately should be there. Now, if you don't have a flattening filter, you don't worry about the positioning of uh, flattening filter and accuracy of it. But how does it have the steering? How does it affect your profile when you don't have a flattening filter? Actually, measurements demonstrate that for variation in beam steering and bending magnets, triple F beam exhibits only half the variation of field symmetry compared to a double F beam. If you see this, this is a double F beam. And for a 50 milliampere increase in, or decrease in the current, there is a change like this. Whereas there is only a shift, small shift in the case of uh, triple F beam. So this is something that you need to know when you have a triple F beam, actually the steering coil current doesn't really uh, change your profile as much as it did for a double F beam. And the other important thing is the beam startup characteristics. You know, when we started doing IMRT, when we started delivering small EMUs, we were worried about the startup characteristics of uh, linear accelerator. So small changes in the energy and beam positioning during startup are actually magnified if you have a flattening filter. So when you don't have a flattening filter, this is not very high. The startup characteristics for a conventional beam show only one, uh, show about 1.5% tilt in the beam symmetry for a 5MU beam. Whereas for a triple F beam, the same thing shows only 0.3%. This is again the study by Cashmore et al. And which was published in uh, PMB. The flattening filter is an energy sensitive component producing changes in the beam profile as the beam energy varies. And actually, Electa uses it for servo of beam energies. So for other Linux, it's not an issue. For Electra, this is the, the, this is the servo. So one has to be mindful of that. Now, you don't have flattening filter. Uh, does it mean that you don't have a filter at all? No. You have now changed the flattening filter with a flat filter. Right, so the flattening filter is now replaced by a flat filter. A thin plate in front of the monitor chamber are commonly used in all Linux when operated in triple F mode. And why do you need this flat filter? The flattening filter produced electron which usually reach the monitor chamber. But if you remove the flattening filter, the electron fluence at the level of the monitor chamber is totally different and it's out of usual mode of operation, right? So. It is totally different. The primary electrons penetrating the target when the accelerator was operated at 6 MV more, for example, would increase the surface dose. So having a thin plate would reduce this primary electrons that reaching the patient and increasing the surface, surface dose to prevent the monitor chamber from saturation. See, the low energy photons and electrons when you don't have a flattening filter would make your monitor chamber almost saturate its value. So to avoid that, they keep this thin filter. So that is another help of having a filter there. It is normally recommend, recommended to have one to two mm copper plate as a thin filter, but they actually use a very thicker plate. You know the reason, the reason is very interesting. To absorb electron in case of target failure. Suppose if the target fails, the idea of your flattening filter was there to attenuate the electrons. But now if your target fails, it will straight away come or come down to a chamber and then to the patient. So that is the thicker plates, if you have, it will absorb those electrons in case of target failure. This is something very interesting uh, thing. I know I'm not sure whether you really uh, thought about this point uh, when you are using with a flattening filter beam, filtered beam. 
For example, the flattened beam, the beam hardening is more at the center than at the off axis. See, the thickness of the beam at the flattening filter is larger at the center and it's less. So when the B, the radiation that goes to the X-rays that go through the center of the flattening filter will have more beam hardening. More soft X-rays will be absorbed. But whereas in the periphery, less beam hardening will happen. So the if you even though you say the flattening filter brings in a uniform intensity, but it is not actually bringing in a uniform energy fluence across the beam. The energy fluence across the beam will change because of this. You can see this graph. This is the central axis. The energy is almost too higher because of higher hardening here at the central axis. At the off axis, the energy fluence, if you see, it's towards the lower energy. But if you remove the flattening filter, you compare your central axis and the off axis, they are overlapping almost. So the energy fluence at the central axis and the off axis is the same. Right? So this is a very interesting thing which I learned recently. Um, so we did a small experiment. You know, I can't create uh, energy, uh, study the fluence of energy in a linear accelerator in a clinical setup. So what we did was, I asked my colleague uh, Timothy to do it. A very simple thing we did. Uh, how do you do your energy check? You do a TPR 2010, right? So we did the same TPR 2010 for a 6 me at the ISO center. And then we went off axis about seven centimeter. To go off axis of seven centimeter, we used a 20 by 20 field size, right? So we didn't use 10 by 10. So you see, there is a significant difference in the energy index. If you consider this as energy index, it is 0.72 at the central axis and 0.69 at the seven centimeter from the central axis. But if you go to a six triple F, the decrease is not that much, 0.68 to 0.66. Similarly, for 10 MV, it is 0.78 to 0.75. If it is a double F, if it is triple F, it is 0.74 to 0.73. So the previous slide, which we study, which we looked at, where the energy is lower at the off axis regions for filtered beam, flattening filtered beam, is explained by TPI 2010 here. I don't know whether this is the right method to do it, but it's interesting. It makes us understand much better. And the beam hardening effect has one more thing, like the off axis spectral dependence is very small in unflattened beam. So the spectral dependence of unflattened beam in the off axis is very small. The spectrum is almost the same. So it is very favorable for dose calculation. The other thing is because you don't have a flattening filter, the electron contribution contamination is also remote. It is also not there. So your TPS can now do much better calculation, more accurate calculation. The other interesting thing, if you see, because of the spectral effect between the central axis and the off axis, I show you the beam profiles here for a flattened beam at various depths and for unflattened beam, triple F beam at various depths. Here, the shape is the same, whatever the depth is, only the divergence, the profile is larger. But here, the shape also changes, you can see. Here, it goes up and then comes down, whereas at a depth, it goes like this. This is because of the spectral variation between the central axis and the off axis region. Okay, let us look at now the energy index. I, we discussed, uh, discussed this, but I have a small interesting point to show that why I brought in this slide. If you look at the TPR 2010, I did it for a true beam. You know, normally when you do work on a LINAC, you have a lot of energies in electrons. Now you see, I worked with the LINAC where I had to work with six photon energies, right? A lot of work, you know, in uh, commissioning. Six X, six triple F, eight X, 10 X, 10 triple F and 15 X, right? It, is, uh, it was really annoying to do so many calibration and we may not use 15 and uh, maybe even eight, but it's interesting physics. If you look at for six X, it is 0.665 is the TPR 2010, but when you go to triple F, it is 0.628 it is lower, right? Similarly for 10, it is 0.736 and 0.705. But if you look at 10 triple F compared to 10 X, it has come to 0.705, which is almost equivalent to an eight X with double F. So the energy, uh, the flat uh, triple F beam of 10 X, 10 is almost like same energy as an eight X of flattened beam, uh, you know, flattened beam. 
So this is uh, something interesting data I did for Edge as well as for TrueBeam STX, and uh, the data were like if you take an average, they all come to point some six six or six six five or something. It's almost the same for all the three machines. The other interesting thing is the build-up depth. You know, when you have an unflattened beam, that is, there is no beam hardening, so you have a lot of soft X-rays. So you tend to think your build-up depth should be much smaller than that you have for a regular 6x for example say for example if you have for 6x 1.5 or 1.6 this is much softer it is equivalent to like 4 mv or something mv or something so the build up depth should not be 1.5 1.6 should be smaller but actually if you see it is the same it is because the reduced collimator scatter increases the build up in double f you have a lot of collimator scatter which you don't have here See, these two are competing things. One decreases the buildup, other one increases the buildup. Yeah, effectively, your buildup for 6x and 6 triple F are almost the same. 6 double F and 6 triple F are almost the same. Same thing with 10 double F and 10 triple F. I hope you make this point. This the soft component of the X-rays actually should reduce the buildup, but the scatter uh, should uh, increase the buildup. The lack of scatter should increase the buildup. So you have the same buildup for 6x and 6 triple F. Let us look at the surface dose. There is a slight increase in the surface dose when you remove the flattening filter, particularly if you're working with a narrow beam, because you have a soft beam. The soft beam will bring in you know more surface dose because more low low energy x-ray components so you will have more surface dose but as you increase the field size you know what happens is your surface dose doesn't increase very much for triple f but increases a lot for a double f because when you go for a larger there is more scatter if you look at this table for 10 by 10 for example if you look at for six double f it is 26 percent and triple if it's more 33 percent but when you go for 30 by 30 it is more for double f it is less for triple f and this more pronounced in 10 by 10 as you can see 40 percent and 32 percent probably if you've gone a little further here it would have been pronounced here also as you can see in this graph the surface dose is more for small field size of triple f but less for large field size of triple f because there is certainly lack of scatter when you have the triple f less scattered due to that the other interesting thing is the peripheral dose you know we have been saying you removed one component from the lean act which was contributing to a lot of scatter now that component is not there so naturally the scattered dose is less so the peripheral dose should be less with uh, triple fb so we did some measurement at two meter distance for various angles from the gantry as you can see in this picture you can see that for six triple f it is almost half that of six, uh, six double F and 10 triple F also, it is less than half of 10 double F. It's all measured in micro sievert. And you can see it is 68 and 26. So significant reduction in the scattered dose when you use a triple F beam. The other thing is the neutron. Therapeutic beams, as I said earlier, with the energy is greater than eight and we undergo photonuclear reactions and produce interact with the high atomic number material. When they do that, they undergo photonuclear reaction um, and they produce neutrons. Particularly, it happens in the treatment head when they interact with the various collimators and other things. And the neutrons have high radiobiological effectiveness and therefore it is of concern in radiation protection. One of the main uh, new sources of neutron is the head, LINAC head, and the flattening filter, right? The flattening filter in the LINAC head. Now, if you remove that, then there is a significant reduction in the neutron production. So it is not really a major concern. And moreover, most of the LINACs uh, that have the triple F, except Siemens, which is not in the market now, uh, have not very high energies with the triple F. So the neutron is not an issue even otherwise, and you don't have high energy beams where you have to worry about neutrons. And we also did for 10 MV some neutron uh, measurement. There's something interesting which I want to uh, share with you. For example, if you look at this, I have for 10X and 10 triple F the neutron measurement, that is the micro sievert per hour at one meter and two meter. For 10X, it is 16 micro sievert for 
10 triple F, it is 20 microsievert. I just said with triple F, the neutron should be less. But here, if you see, the neutron contribution seems to be more here, right? So you must be concerned, but it is not correct way of saying it. That is the reason. For example, this is per hour. Let me call it per minute. Per minute, if I use a 10 double F, I will give maybe 600 EMU or 600 CGY, and I get uh, six microsievert. If I use 10 triple F, I will have 2400 CGY, and I get 20 microsievert. So when I normalize this to the photon, then 10 triple F actually gives you much, much lower neutron contribution, right, compared to 10 double F. So it has to be normalized to the amount of photon that it generates. There are special considerations you have to look at when you calibrate a triple F beam. Actually, I took it from AAPM report. One is the energy and the beam fluence spectrum you have to be mindful of. And as per AAPM protocol, you need to use an 1mm filter for removing electron contamination for determination of KQ. It is not required for TRS-398, but this has been a question mark whether you should use this or not. But now they say it's prudent to use this unless it is proved it is not necessary. And increased dose per pulse, so higher correction of uh, P ion, we will look at that. Calibration of ion chamber volume and its position is very important. The volume of the ion chamber that you're going to use and how you position in your triple F beam is important for calibration. And as I said, TG51 requires one mm lead filter. Uh, this is to reduce the electron contamination at Dmax, but it's again unclear whether you need to use it or not, but it is prudent to use it. Let us look at positioning of and volume of the chamber. See, the radiation beam profile for triple F is forward peaked. So if you have a large volume chamber, there will be a partial volume averaging will happen. Actually, it has been measured for formaldehyde chamber by Cry at all, and it is to be 0.2 percent. They are given for both the energies. The other important thing, so you anyway, you need to check whether there is any volume averaging per formal type they have done. And other thing is your positioning. It has to be exactly at the center. If you slightly position off axis, there will be a gradient of dose, and you will have an averaging effect. So positioning has to be very correct, and the volume you have to make sure there is no averaging of the dose there. So the other thing is the ion recombination. The increased uh, dose per pulse of triple F beam results in increased ion recombination factor. So the P ion correction has to be a larger one, like the one you give, we call it uh, K in the TRS-399, they call it P ion, I think in APM one it has to be a larger one. You can use the same two voltage formalism and the approach was found to be within 0.3% for formal type chambers. And of course, the P ion will be slightly larger by 0.3%. But anyway, when you use the same two voltage method, you will be able to identify what is the P ion correction needed. And the output factor in air is another thing. We have been saying there is less air scatter. So what happens with that is another interesting thing. The concept of output ratio in the air, that is SC, was introduced to characteristic how the incident photon fluence per MU varies with the collimator. Some of the treatment planning system ask you to input SC and SP, I understand. But with Eclipse, we do only the output factor. And this quality quantity is called the collimator scatter factor, as I said earlier. And for triple of beam, the increase in SC from 3 by 3 to 40 by 40 is like 3% to about 1% for a variation of 3 by 3 to 40 by 40. Whereas for double of beam, it is 8% to 7% increase. So, and for a clinically used beam of about 5 to 20 centimeters square, for triple F, it is only 1.5% increase. So, this is something which is very important and in interesting to note when you do the uh, commissioning of a triple F beam. The last thing is the beam penumbra. You know, the profile is not the same. So how do you measure beam penumbra? Either the 20% to 80% is okay for this. Quite a few people have worked on it. And as you can see here, this is by the 
Monish et al. who said, what you do is you find the inflection point for the unflattened beam and the inflection point for the flattened beam. So flattened beam and the unflattened beam and take the ratio and normalize to the central axis dose. And then you do the same 80 by 20 here in this and you bring it here and calculate 80 20 for the beam profile. But later, there were other studies which said the detector resolution could affect this method a lot. So they actually had a third derivative and renormalized uh, the triple F beam with the double F beam. See what they took a point somewhere here and like your double F beam and renormalized this to 100%, right? And then you take the same uh, 80 by 20%. So the renormalization method is given that equation has been provided. You should use this equation to renormalize your graph and then calculate your number here. The atomic energy regulatory board has a totally very different uh, definition in India for the triple F beam. They have defined two points called PA and PB which are located at 1.6 and 0.4 times of the relative dose factor. And these points are to be identified first. The lateral separation of these two points will measure the penumbra. So first you have to find what is PA, where is PA and where is PB and find the distance between them and that will provide the penumbra. They also gave one more thing called degree of unflatness a measure of the degree of unflatness, where they measure the 60% to 90% and 75% profile width from the central axis. And they use this as the degree of unflatness. Both are to be determined while commissioning a triple F beam for the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board purpose. They actually gave a task group report where these two are important. So when we did our beam in Velo, so it was a bit difficult to find for, for me probably you would do it. I saw some people doing it very easily uh, to determine the PA and PB. So what I did was I wrote a small MATLAB uh, routine to determine this. So what the MATLAB routine does is it goes from here and determines where the slope is one, you know, calculate the slope. Okay, the slope is one here. It will take this point and come back from here and where the slope is one and take and take these two points and take the midpoint of it, which is the relative dose factor value. This is the H and you take the midpoint of it. And then you take 1.6 times here, go up and note the PA and go 1.4, sorry, 0.4 times down and note the PB and look at the separation between them, which will be the perimbra. So I just did a small uh, MATLAB routine, which gives me an output like this made my life a little easy when we were commissioning the triple F beam here. And it also gives you a degree of unflatness measurement that 90, 75 and 60% uh, width of the profile. Okay, let us come to some clinical implementation. I'll take a few more minutes to explain this. So now we looked at triple F beam when you go clinically. Uh, my first question was we were one of the SRS uh, people in India. We started SRS for a lot long, long time ago, more than uh, 24 years we have been doing SRS. And interestingly, we still use static 3D CRT type of SRS, right? And uh, whether we can use a triple F for that was the question because it has got a peaked one. If you're using um, uh, IMRT or uh, VMAT, that's fine. But if you are using a 3D CRT, whether you can use this. So what I did was I compared the profile of uh, double F and triple F and looked at where it actually changes. So this is for a one centimeter beam profile and they both overlap. So if I'm using one centimeter, I'm treat one centimeter lesion or less than that, I can use triple F profile. It will be the same like a double F profile, but the advantage I will get is less treatment time, right? I can still do static 3D CRT type of SRS. And then I tried for two centimeter. It is overlapping with triple F and double F profiles are overlapping. Went for three centimeters. It's a very small difference, but it's still almost overlapping everywhere. And when I went to four, there was a slight difference and five, six big difference and the difference started increasing. So as you can see here, so up to three centimeter, there is no problem. So we decided we can use safely like we use double F beam 
the triple F beam for stereotactic radio surgery with conformal beams, regular conformal beams. And the advantage we get is much less treatment time. So I to before we clinically go, so we thought we will do some studies. So I took about 30 patients of acoustic tumors and compared the plan with double F and triple F. The number of beams ranged from five to nine. Our coverage, PTV coverage is 80%. We normally don't give margin. That's the you know, school of thought and the practice at our hospital. Most critical organs like eye, optic nerve, chiasm are totally not in the path of the beam is avoided. And the PTV volume ranged, what are in the, the cohort of 30 patients I had, ranged from 4.49 to 8.1 cc, and the mean being uh, 2.9 cc. When we did uh, average value, the V80% was about 95.38 percentage of the volume. Uh, whereas where the triple F it was 94 points. So it's not a big difference. It's like than 0.5 percent. And the maximum tumor dose was actually slightly higher with triple F on an average. And the conformity index was almost the same, except triple F had a slightly lower, but it did vary between the cases. And the gradient index was again almost the same, 2.73 and 2.74. The gradient index I measured was V50 by V80. <clears throat> so this is the uh, case study one of the 30 patients I did. Uh, it's the smallest volume of 0.493 cc. And you can see there is not a big difference in the V80, that is the tumor volume coverage. Maximum dose is almost the same. Conformity index is not very different. And the brainstem dose, actually in this case, it's a little lower than uh, the double F in the case of triple F, but it's not necessarily for every patient. So this is the um, DVH. You can see a very small change here in the DVH, and for brainstem, it is almost like overlapping, not a big difference. And for another distribution, I just skipped one. It's for the largest uh, field size, and V80 is again 76.9 and uh, sorry, 97.6 and 96.4, and the Dmax is very nearly the same, and the conformity index was also the same. So. This is the beam pro, uh, uh, DVH comparison for these two, a slightly lower DVH I get with the triple F beam here. So the radio surgery with, if you do IMRS, how does it happen? So I, with double F and triple F, I did the IMRS for this, but my feeling is like 3D CRT was as good and we could do a good, uh, uh, when you compare between double F and triple F, triple F is as good as double F or, and, lesser treatment time. So when I went to IMRS, it's again 93.78 and 94%. The brainstem wire was less and the gradient index was cheaper for triple F and the mean total EMU for double F and triple F plans were nearly the same. And it was, the EMU was about 6,039 and 5,000, uh, 5,900 for triple F. So this is actually a dose distribution between uh, double F and triple F. Um, this is for double F and this is for a triple F. And the dose volume histogram actually all you know, overlaps for the brainstem as well as for the tumor volume. We, I also looked at SBRT. I took a level, level lesion of 3.8 centimeter diameter equivalent and with, with VMAT, I used 6X, 6 F and 10 F and single and double ox and just looked at what, how, which one would be good. Like you can see that this is 6 F and 6 F VMAT single arc. And of course, where the double F, it is triple uh, F, it is slightly lower uh, coverage here very, very small uh, difference. And with the 10 triple F single and double arc, uh, with the single arc of course is slightly lower here. It's, I actually uh, tabled some of the parameters between uh, 6X, 6 triple F with the two arcs, 10 triple F and 10 triple F two arcs. You can see that the V95 was almost the uh, same. There was not a much big difference and V50, was again almost the same. And where we were gaining was in the treatment time. Look at, for 6X, we get about 200 seconds to deliver the same thing. With 6 triple F, for the same dose, we need only 84 seconds. And when I use two arcs, it is 10. But when I go to 
10 triple F, it is only 44 seconds and 60 seconds with that. And the average speed of the gantry varies from 0.9 to actually here, it is six, right? So <clears throat> there is a significant advantage in using six triple F as far as the uh, treatment time is concerned. So what are the advantages of uh, triple F beam? Reduction in head scatter, which is about 70%, Decreased penumbra and lower dose outside the field edge, doubling of dose rate, uh, useful for small radio surgery fields and for SBRT. And of course, you can use it for IMRS and IMRT also. Uh, thank you very much for your patient listening. If you have any doubt and if I can explain, I would be happy to share. Uh, thank you, Professor Paul, for the impeccable presentation. And uh, although I have many questions in my mind, I would uh, give this opportunity to the audience for questions because of the we are running out of time now. So, So if there is any questions from the audience, they are feel free to type it on the window, which is in front of you in the box, or you will be able to talk using your uh, microphones. So I have a question regarding the surface dose that you have stated, especially when it comes to tomotherapy and radixab. So when we are using the TOMO technology, see if the triple F beams makes a contribution in the increase in the surface load. How will be the, you know, the future technologies which are coming up with the radix and 